Gender Revolution by E.S. Wynn The final sexual revolution came with the invention, social acceptance, and subsequent widespread use of a system of perfect synthetic surrogates. Within a decade of the system's integration into the everyday life and future of the middle class, a stigma rose within the elite that labeled natural birth as an unclean and backward system used only by those who were too poor to afford in vitro. Sterilization parties became a part of popular culture, and as commerce responded in turn, producing happy sterilization cards and appropriately themed party favors, the idea entrenched itself within society as a new tradition, a rite of passage that both boys and girls underwent at the onset of puberty. With reproduction increasingly more and more the business of machines and engineers, new social protest groups emerged, factions within society like the Daughters of Diana, a movement which encouraged complete hysterectomies as part of a means of combating the fascist male regime by removing the primary organs through which the leaders of the movement felt male dominance behavior was inadvertently encouraged and therefore perpetrated. Abhorring all surgeries and sterilization procedures that involved modifying the natural state of the human genitalia, the Daughters of Mary stood as both a rallying flag and a stereotypical example of those who stood against and protested, sometimes violently, the burgeoning practices of the mainstream sexual infrastructure. Other groups, such as the gender aesthetics, ultimately leaned toward a total erasure of sexual identity, encouraging a sort of asexual androgyny within society that involved a complete mastectomy for women and the surgical realignment inward of external genitalia for men. As widespread implementation of bacteria-based pharmacological farms allowed for the synthesis of designer hormones to become increasingly more mainstream, advancements within the research cabals of these farms gave the revolution the fuel it needed to carry itself past the tumultuous early stages in which gender conflicts became increasingly more heated in regards to the steady erosion of sexual identity as a constant and defining factor of the individual. Delivered in capsule form, along with a cocktail of pre-programmed nanites, the designer hormone cultures that ultimately became a mark of haute culture, and only later a mainstay of all but the lowest strata of society, were keyed to provide gender transformations designed to take place while the consumer slept. This availability of complete, literally overnight, and easily reversible changes in gender ultimately changed the way in which gender itself was viewed, reassigning it to the state of an impermanent persona, a hat, which could be taken on or off at will. Further advances in genetic engineering and mandates put forth by the state led to official legislation that required all children to be born gender neutral and ensured that only upon reaching adulthood would such children legally be allowed to be gendered as they so pleased. This, of course, led to a gender black market where young, neutrally gendered teens could experiment with street quality hormone nanite tandem injections and experience being gendered in a sex friendly environment. Campaigns were launched about the unsafe nature of such street cocktails and sex easies, creating iconic figures of those who had died from bad mixes or superbug STDs, and claiming that those who were illegally gendered before legal adulthood produced lower academic scores on average than those who remained gender neutral, regardless of the length of time spent gendered. Even as time passed and the restraints on minors were relaxed, gender remained primarily the plaything of the adult community, a commodity with all the social joys and stigmas of any legal recreational drug. Regularly engaging in gendered activities was eventually viewed as a sort of psychological illness or dependence similar to alcoholism, and as support groups for the overly gendered found their place within society, many gender-neutral individuals found less and less appeal in taking on any gender role for any length of time, except in the case of the occasional party or social event. Those who chose living gendered over an androgynous lifestyle were seen as traditionalist, backward individuals and primitives who had lost touch with reality. Eventually, the old sexual divisions of male and female were forgotten by the mainstream, and only appeared in the occasional gender party in which guests would adopt the physical traits, stereotypical dress, and mannerisms of past genders in the spirit of fun, easily glossing over the memories of a past that had long since disappeared beneath the tide of romantic notions, and the forgotten books written by historians who had either been unwilling or unable to change their own genders.